Meet Aman. Today, we found out why he decided to go all in on YouTube. I was a software engineer for about eight months before I left my job to be a full-time YouTuber and coach. Really wanted just to have freedom and be able to do my own thing. What it actually took to get where he is right now. Before work, I would spend like an hour or two working on YouTube, filming videos, editing, scripting. Then I would go to work, spend the whole day at work thinking about YouTube. For lunch, I'd come back, try to get as much time as possible to work on YouTube. Then I'd leave work as soon as possible and spend three hours a day work in the evening working on YouTube. What would happen if it doesn't work out? I can always go back to being a software engineer. Software engineer will always be there. I know how it's done. My entire channel is about getting a job in software engineering. But maybe I'll never have a better opportunity to become an entrepreneur to go all in on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And if you do, please consider subscribing to the channel. Enjoy. For those who are unfamiliar with you, who are you? What do you do? And why should people listen to you? Yeah, so my name is Aman. I was a software engineer for about eight months before I left my job to be a full-time YouTuber and coach. And some background on me, I grew up my entire life as a huge fan of tech. I actually remember there was a moment in high school where the iPhone 10 came out. So this was 2017. I was probably 16, 17 years old at that point. And I actually snuck out of class to watch the Apple event. I was that excited about the new phone. So I just had a fascination with technology, new smartphones, devices, stuff like that. I'd watch all these tech YouTubers. So kind of naturally, my choice degree was computer science. I did a bunch of computer science at high school and just decided to go into it in college. And in college, I ended up doing five software engineering internships at a bunch of companies like Shopify, Amazon, John Deere, stuff like that. And that kind of naturally led into being a full-time software engineer. Now on the side throughout college, I was creating content about being a computer science major, study tips, productivity. And I kind of fell into the career internship niche on YouTube when it comes to software engineering, kind of by accident. Like, I don't think I ever realized that I was going to become a career YouTuber, but I made a few videos about how I got my Amazon internship, how I got my Shopify internship, advice for students who want to get actual experience to get software engineering jobs, and that turned into my full-time job. So yeah, I'm a full-time YouTuber career coach. Nice. I like how you mentioned I was a software engineer. When did you switch to full-time? Yeah, so I actually left my job probably three months ago now. So I was working full-time for seven or eight months after I graduated college. And I enjoyed the job, it was pretty good. And I like software engineering, I like coding, programming, and I love the people there, but I think entrepreneurship bug had just been on me for too long. And I've been watching Ali Abdal's videos, who's like a YouTuber, and that's actually how we met. There was a certain level of freedom that I just really wanted. And in my job, every day I'd walk in, sit there, like get coding, open my computer, talk to my teammates and coworkers. But I always felt like there was like, my boss was always there and he was like always looking at me. And maybe he wasn't thinking about me all the time, but I just felt like I didn't like the feeling of being at the beck and call of one person. I would rather be at the beck and call of like clients or customers of the market. And that was one aspect of it. Yeah. Another aspect was was I really wanted just to have freedom and be able to do my own thing in the way that if I want to travel for a week to see my family or go to a wedding, it, I just really hated the feeling of having to like ask one guy, hey, am I allowed to take a day off today? Am I allowed to work remotely today? So about three months ago, I left my job and those are some of the reasons why. It's interesting because sometimes people think, yeah, I'm just going to go full time, whatever it happens, I'm going to do content creation. But there has been a process behind it. You mentioned that you did it in university. So you've been doing content creation for a while before you actually decided I'm going to try it full time. 100%. What led you to do content creation in at the beginning, actually? Why YouTube and no, why Instagram? Why not mm -hmm. something else? Yeah. That's a good question. So I actually have been like a fan of YouTube since I was probably like 11 or 12 years old. And I think this is a pretty common thing amongst like men, actually. I think from a young age, I've been watching gaming videos, Minecraft videos, uh, the whole the whole shebang. I was like part of that like 2013, yeah, 2013, 2014 Minecraft era of YouTube. And at that point, yeah, I was just a huge fan of the platform. I was watching Rhett and Link, Good Mythical Morning. And I would actually do the common thing where I would like make a channel with some random name, post some Minecraft videos once or twice, and then like never touch a channel again again or make a comedy sketch in middle school post it on there post my class projects so i was just genuinely passionate about youtube and the platform through high school and through middle school i was an avid consumer of content on youtube i had so many favorite youtubers i probably spent at least an hour a day on the platform or probably ages 12 to 18 at least so I understood the platform of YouTube as a consumer more than any of the other platforms out there, though I did have like an Instagram and Snapchat account. That was like the backdrop there. And I was familiar with like editing because I was making YouTube videos already just like with random channels, gaming, random things like that, right? And when I was about 19 years old, so this is five, six years of just making videos here and there for no particular reason, I stumbled upon this YouTuber named Ali Abdal. 
one of the first videos I watched to him was in 2020, where he just showed how much money he made off of Skillshare and his YouTube channel. And just seeing those dollars on the screen as like a college student, the idea that like you could make money online and it was that much money just blew my mind. And from that moment on, I just like listened to every word he said. Like he was literally like, start a YouTube channel. I actually made a Skillshare class before I started a YouTube channel. Cause like back then I just had no understanding of like the entrepreneurship online, but I just yeah. tried to copy him at that point. And he had a YouTube channel. So I just started a YouTube channel. That was like the inciting thing that made me do it when I was a college student. What felt you so related to Ali Abdal? Cause it's the second time you mentioned him. What makes you feel that's the guy, mm -hmm. you know? Why not someone like Casey Neistat or <laughs> someone else? Why Ali Abdal? Yeah, it's interesting. I think like most people have one or two biggest influences when it comes to entering this game. Casey Neistat is a big one for a lot of people. Like they'll start with vlogging and stuff like that. But for me, I think Ali Abdal, I felt like he was exactly like me, just six or seven years older. So he was mm. like similar ethnicity, similar background. He also had like a younger brother as well. He was in like the traditional game, whether it's like computer science or medicine. His mom is a doctor. My parents are doctors. He grew up Muslim. I also grew up Muslim. And he just spoke like a very similar language as me. And I felt like when I saw him doing his thing, it was very achievable. Like I could see it and he would just reveal everything that he did and he would give advice for people who want to do what he's doing. It just felt very tangible. Like I could see exactly how he did it. He was five or six or seven years ahead of me. And it is in my mind, it just clicked. Like I just, this is like an older brother or like a role model. Obviously he doesn't know me, but I can just like copy this exact framework and like maybe I'll have some success. Whereas some other YouTubers, like I would copy them. Like I did copy some Minecraft YouTubers, but I didn't feel like that sense of immediate connection there. I also think part of it is I was like a big academic kind of kid, like really studious. My parents were proud of like the, all the academic work I'd done, grades, standardized tests, all that thing. And I think Ali Abdal was in that niche back in the day. Like he was into that standardized testing, Cambridge medicine, how to study effectively. So that also drew my attention to him because I was trying to apply like his principles as being a student as well at the same time. So it, it was just a really good fit overall. Your parents are doctors, your son of immigrants you mentioned. Yes and you were raised Muslim. Mm -hmm. How did it feel telling your parents, hey mom, dad, I'm uh, quitting my stable career job to pursue this that perhaps I'll earn money, perhaps I won't earn money in the future. How did that conversation go on? For sure. What did they say actually? Yeah, so one thing about my parents is that they were actually along for the ride from day one. So I've been posting content coming up in four years now. I think like maybe this week or next week will be like my four year anniversary of creating content online. And for the whole four years, my parents were there from day one. So they watched every single video and setting the videos to their my other relatives, cousins, aunts and uncles, their friends. So they've seen the journey from day one and setting the videos to their my other relatives, cousins, aunts and uncles, their friends. So they've seen the journey from day one. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that they were also there when I was like watching Ali Abdal's video. So I would send Ali Abdal's videos to them, made a couple of videos about how much money he makes. Like every year he'd do an annual review. We would sit down as a family and I'd put that on the TV in the living room. And my dad would be there, my mom would be there, my grandparents would be there, my aunts and uncles, my brothers would be there. We'd all just be sitting watching this guy talking about how he's making millions and millions of dollars online so i think i just honestly conditioned my parents into believing that it was a reality and also i mean doctors so like they would see ali who was like a doctor as well and just see that like that is very achievable so i almost mm. yeah I, I literally like conditioned my parents into believing that it was a reality just like i was conditioned into believing it was a reality so that's a backdrop there now around this time i also did some coaching programs so we were talking earlier about the youtuber captain sinbad i met him through a coaching program so i signed up for his coaching program did it in november in december of last year one of the best decisions i ever made so I became friends with him through that. And he was talking about the finances and economy of YouTube as well. So he was teaching me those skills and I had already started earning money from YouTube at that point um, through sponsorships, AdSense. So my parents had seen that like some money was coming in, but obviously it wasn't like millions of dollars, right? So that's like the backdrop of it. They knew that huge success was possible because Ali Abdal did it. They knew I'd made a few dollars online, few meaning like probably a couple thousand dollars over the last three or four years from YouTube and sponsorships and my Skillshare class. And the final aspect of this is that they knew that that I wasn't really enjoying my full-time job that much. If you talk about my daily routine, right, I would wake up in the morning before work, I would spend like an hour or two working on YouTube, filming videos,
videos, editing, scripting. Then I would go to work, spend the whole day at work thinking about YouTube. For lunch, I'd come back, take like an hour lunch, like try to get as much time as possible to work on YouTube. Then I'd finish work, then I'd leave work as soon as possible and spend three hours a day work in the evening working on YouTube. I was working 40 hours a week, but probably spending at least 30, 40 hours a week also on YouTube on the side. Extra. Basically, every minute of free time was on YouTube if it wasn't for like socializing or going to the gym. That, that was my entire life. So they saw that as well. And they saw that that was like what I was genuinely excited to do. Now, all of that culminated in a moment where I actually went to this cabin to do this Bill Gates Think Week kind of situation. So if you're unfamiliar, Bill Gates, every couple of years, I think it might be once a year, he takes an entire week and he'll go to a cabin in the woods with no one there and just everything prepared. And he brings probably like 15, 20 books and the entire week he just reads and he just thinks. And those are the weeks that set his course for the entire year. So those are like the true level ups mentally for him. And then he follows like those insights that he gains. And around this time, this is like what, like January, 2024, I was feeling some level of like blaze. I don't know what it was, but in my mind, I just felt like I was in a bit of a rut and I ran I randomly just saw this painting or photo of a cabin at this art museum and immediately I saw that and I just somehow had this like feeling that I have to go and just do this think week. Now I couldn't take a full week off because I was still a corporate worker <laughs> but what I could do is I could spend a weekend in a cabin in the midwest in the US and it was winter right and in the snow in the forest and just like try to read a few books and leave my phone and not really have access to the internet or the wider world. So that's exactly what I did. I booked this cabin in February of 2024 and went to there for that weekend and I actually locked my phone so I couldn't really communicate with anyone. I could only for emergency purposes, call my family. And that's pretty much it. Now that weekend, I read this book called The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Now this is a really famous book and a lot of celebrities have said that it changed their life. And I can attest to that it did change my life. I read this book and it almost felt like it was written for me. Like it felt like this guy, the author Paolo Coelho had like come down and just dropped this book at me. And it was exactly what I needed. And the major lesson I got from this book is it's about this boy named Santiago, who's a shepherd boy. And he gets this vision about this treasure in Egypt. And he has a decision, right? does he go for the treasure or not? Or does he just like accept, no, that treasure is not for me. I'm just going to be a humble shepherd. And the quote that got me most was he said, I can always go back to being a shepherd. The sheep will always be there. Like I know how it's done. I can always go back to it, but maybe there'll never be another chance to get to the pyramids in Egypt. And that line, I literally could swap it out. I could swap out. I can always go back to being a software engineer. Software engineering will always be there. I know how it's done. My entire channel is about getting a job in software engineering, but maybe I'll never have a better opportunity to become an entrepreneur to go all in on YouTube. So that was like almost what sealed the deal. And then there were like a few more conversations after that. I actually hung out with Captain Sinbad and got to see his lifestyle like as an entrepreneur, right? And that really yeah. developed that. But finally, I called my parents. We had a discussion. I was like, I really want to do this. Will you guys support me for the next year while I like try to make this dream a reality? Now, I'm still only 22. So like, I'm still a young guy. So my parents were like, you know what? Screw it. Like, it's fine. We'll support you. We'll like give you a base amount of like just support for food and rent. And if you want to move home, you can also move home as well. So that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Quit my job the next day. So not only... Did they, you condition them to support <laughs> you, but they actually ended up financially supporting you. And just in case that it's needed, you can go back home, have a nice good plate of food there. 100%. That's great to hear. Yeah. A lot of times we see parents, if you don't go through the corporate way, you don't get anything from them. So that's great to hear that your parents supported you in that. For sure. And I think it's mainly just because like if this was five years ago and they'd never seen that it was a possibility to make money online, I think they would have seen it as a much bigger deal than it is. I've also been sending stuff like four hour work week. My parents already read that book. Like, like my parents have kind of been like secondhand consuming all this like entrepreneurship content through us. So yeah, exactly. They were conditioned to believe that it was a reality. I think if it was some other if my parents were different they'd never heard about making money online they only saw that doing it through the normal corporate way is the right way to do then it would have been a different story but luckily they've been pretty supportive so far and how has it been so far you quit four months ago yeah how has that how has <laughs> that journey been it's been a roller coaster i would say i know you're also kind of like on that you work in content creation as well as like your job but then you're also a youtuber which is interesting i, I want to hear more about that but it's been largely i think it was definitely the right decision to quit and go all in on myself like i don't regret quitting for one minute and the amount of learning I've had by going all in has been unimaginable. I think every week I probably learn a new thing about YouTube or business or entrepreneurship or uh, sales and marketing that I just didn't know before. And I can't imagine that I just had so much knowledge that was not there. So that's a huge thing. Now, there's definitely a great deal of uncertainty. Like, I mean, there are good weeks and bad weeks, right? There are like certain weeks where I lose a sponsorship or the sponsorship is being annoying and I don't want to do it or a client is being difficult to work with. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, like maybe this whole thing's going to crash and burn. Like in 
April, I did really well monetary wise. I earned like a lot more than I spent in April, but then in May, I spent a lot more than I earned. And it was like this kind of like seesaw back and forth where some months you're doing well, some months you're not doing well. So that's like definitely the negative. I think when you're a corporate worker, there's like huge amount of stability. You're sitting there, your paycheck is being deposited bi-monthly. Your couple thousand dollars are just like in your bank account. There's like no worry in that way. And there's a trade-off, right? When you're a corporate worker, you have to please your boss. And I think that's like a level of stress, but it's been good overall. I think 100% the right decision. And I think things are looking good right now. I, we can also talk about like what the next steps are for me, like business wise, but yeah, I think it was 100% the right decision and it's been a little bit up and down, but it's good right now. That's great to hear. I think especially at your age is you just need to do it. I'm 28, just turned 28, like two weeks ago. Oh, nice. Happy birthday. And uh, Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have my parents to rely on because I live on the other side of the world. So I do need to work and I couldn't just quit my job mm -hmm. from one month to another and go for it and try it, even though I would love to and I would want to just say fuck it and mm -hmm. do it, you know, but yeah. For sure. I'm married now. I need to sustain myself, <laughs> yeah. have my dog. It's not a kid, but it's like my kid. <laughs> so I feel like a little bit of that pressure in that sense. But if you can do it, that's always the way. Mm -hmm. 100%. What's in plan for Amon Manasser in the future business-wise, actually? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Touching on your point, though, I think I'm in a unique spot in my life where I have literally no commitments or dependence. I'm unmarried, graduated college. It's still cool to live with your parents at my age. Nobody's going to judge me if I'm here. Like half the people I know no. who are corporate workers are also living with their parents or they're like unemployed yeah. after college. <laughs> so nobody bats an eye that I'm at home right now. It's literally completely normal. So this was this one opportunity where I'm like, okay, this is the year where I can do it. This is the year where it's still cool to live at home. This is the year where no, where my parents can't support me. I have no commitments. I have no wife. I have no kids or anything like that. So yeah, I think on your point, it is easier the younger you are. So like if you're a young person, I would say bias towards going all in. But obviously if you're older, right, you have some commitments, you can't necessarily quit your job immediately. I think that I still would have continued YouTube even if I was my job it just would have been a lot slower so mm. because i have the time to go all in my progression has been a lot faster now obviously it's more risky right i'm like burning money i'm probably like if we actually talk numbers here i've spent over thirty thousand dollars on youtube in the last six months and oh, wow. i've earned 22 21 thousand dollars so i'm still yeah, like so negative in the 9K. minus yeah i'm still negative yeah. 9k right now i had a good amount of savings though from software engineering that i'm tapping on in that way and like i know my food is going to be covered because i'm at home right so it's still a risk and i'm still kind of going all in on myself like it still might not work out the biggest concern or my thought process here is that I can only go back to bottom. Like three years ago, I had zero money anyway. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, who cares? Exactly. It's like literally the worst that can happen is that my bank account just goes to zero. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'm starting from scratch now. And the worst that can happen is that, yeah, I just go back to zero and that's not too bad. I think the worst that can happen is you just go back to the corporate world if it doesn't work out. Exactly. I mean, you're young. I read this quote the other day. There's no worse regrets than the regret of not doing something. And if you just do it, but it fails, well, at least you tried. There's no regrets there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was also thinking about about this too like exactly what you said right the failure case is what i was already doing anyway <laughs> yeah so it's like there's literally no downside to going all in and trying it but another side of this is i was thinking like would i actually go back to software engineering if i had to and i don't know if i would i think i might try to join the creator economy because i feel like mm -hmm. the the lessons i've learned growing my own channel to 42,000 subscribers right now there's got to yeah. be youtubers who actually are interested in hiring people who have experience with like full stack youtube development and maybe i'll get paid less than i would as a software engineer but that side of the world or that side of business is more interesting to me at the moment. But you asked me like, what's next for business for me? So if we just kind of break down, oh, out of curiosity, is your is your podcast like about business? Like how, how in detail should I go here? Whatever you want. It's more, we discuss, you know, like the intersection between happiness and money mm -hmm. and then how we can live a fulfilled life. But anything that it's business related, you can go as detailed as you want. If it's happiness and fulfillment related, it's also. Awesome. Yeah. So business for me, I kind of break it down in like a few different categories. So the main priority for me right now is building out my product, my offer that I can offer my audience and making at the best product in the world in this niche. Uh, what the product is right now is like my audience are computer science students and graduates who want to get jobs in tech, right? And what I'm working on is like a full coaching program where I basically take you, train you and help you get a job in tech. It's like a full extension of my value proposition and just like a much more hands-on structured course coaching program approach. Now, the biggest thing for me, which will like unlock is if I can make this thing one of the best coaching programs out there, like basically everybody who comes in, commits, does the homework, gets their job in tech, that'll be like a massive unlock for me. And the reason why I want to go all in on this is because as a YouTuber, you have like a few avenues of monetization, right? You can yeah. have AdSense. That's not really an option for me. I only earn like last month, I only earned like $800 off of AdSense, which is nice. It's like a nice little bonus, but it's not going to sustain me long term. Then you have sponsorships and sponsorships are decent. But the problem with sponsorships is that they remind me of having a boss. <laughs> 
mm. in the way that I'm beholden to this sponsor. They pay me late half the time. They're annoying to deal with. They want me to change the title and thumbnail. They're like, post this video now. I'm like, it's not ready. They're like, post it anyway. It's just, it's just a nightmare to deal with half these sponsors. So I don't want to do that. And I don't think I'm going to get to six or seven figures through sponsorship. It's just not going to happen for me. So that brings me to the third thing, which is like building my own product and then pitching that on the YouTube channel. Because I mean, sponsors are paying for like a 60 second ad spot. If I can just pitch my own product in that 60 second ad spot, I can capture all of the upside. And also my product is like more value aligned with my audience anyway, compared to their sponsorship. Yeah. So it'll be like Skillshare sponsoring me, which is fine. I like Skillshare. I made a Skillshare class, but Skillshare is not a hundred percent value proposition aligned with my audience. My audience wants to get jobs in tech. So if I can make a company that helps you get a job in tech, that'll be like way better to pitch to my actual audience. And it's me too. So they'll be more interested in it. So the next step uh, over the next six months is just growing that program, getting more clients, making it one of the best experiences out there. When will you know you made it? Because you're giving yourself this one year. Mm -hmm. What is the goal within this one year? For sure. Honestly, like, I feel like most people don't dive into specifics. So I'll give you exact numbers here related to like my mental plot, plot right? So there's a few steps here. Step one is to not lose money. <laughs> I'm still negative like 9K, negative 8K. Though if we do encounter, like if we factor in money, I'm like going to get in a few weeks, I'm probably like negative 4K. So not too bad hmm. right now. But the first goal is to hit profitability within the next probably two months, hopefully. At that point, I'll be making money from my channel, from my business. And that's the first hurdle. Can I hit profitability? Can I grow the coaching program? Can I get good sponsors who are paying me high rates so that every month I'm not losing money? That's the first step. The second step to know if I've made it or not, I've defined making it as not having to go back to working a nine to five job or working for someone else. That means I've made it. And that's actually not that high of a bar. I think honestly, I've made it seven, $8,000 a month. Like obviously I say $10,000 a month. Cause that's like, everybody's like, oh, 10 K a month. Like dude, if you hit 10 K a month online, that's like a big thing, right? My goal is 10 K a month profit. And that kind of like outputs after taxes to like seven to $8,000 a month. And that's actually how much I was earning in my software engineering job out of college. I was earning like roughly 10 K a month in that job. So if I can hit like that 10 K a month profit, then I've made it. Now, obviously I'm not gonna be like a millionaire at that point. I mean, hopefully one day, but what 10 K a month will give me is, first of all, it, it means I will never have to go back to working a nine to five job ever again if I don't want to. That is such a great unlock that it's unimaginable. <laughs> that basically means I'm fine. Like just yeah. that mentally. Like if someone could hand me a ticket being like, dude, you don't know what, but you're never gonna go back to a nine to five job if you don't want to. That's yeah, like get a it. <laughs> huge amount of peace, right? So yeah, indeed. That, that, that's one thing. The second thing is like location, time, freedom, and just, I can just do my own thing. So I define success for me at least as hitting 10k a month and the goal is to hit that by march or april of next year so like in 10 months from now yep. it's doable right should be doable i think it's doable i mean i might hit it earlier hopefully i hit it earlier but i think that's like a really reasonable goal is to like hit it by early next year nice mm -hmm. what is your dream life in that sense would that be your dream life because you say get to 10k not work for someone else what would be the a month's dream life. Yeah. Well, before we get into that, like, tell me what's your, what's your situation right now? I'm very curious. Like you are working as part of part-time YouTuber accelerator. I know. Are you working another job or is that the only like, no, I have, I'm working as a business controller for a company Oh, nice. and commodities that's 40 hours. Then I'm working 10 hours for YouTuber Academy Damn. <laughs> and then content creation. Wow. So you're still in that grind, the 40 hours. I'm still in grind. that grind. Yeah. Wow unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> so do you have like an action plan for like do you plan to leave at some point or our goal is 2027 to live in a van for like a year mm. with my wife wow and then we're just if it's earlier it's earlier if we get if she gets a remote job then yeah we do that earlier if also earlier as well but the goal is 2027 to do that wow so do you have like a out of curiosity i haven't even looked at your channel much like where are you at business wise on the channel is it like just far far away <laughs> <laughs> is it just getting more views subscribers right now or building an offer what are your thoughts there right now it's my standpoint is to building an audience because right now i'm north of i'm like 1800 I've struggled a lot to find what, what I wanted to make content mm -hmm. around. I struggle also to commit to that content. Now I found an editor. So I have an editor that helps me mm -hmm. make those videos. Also helps me to stay accountable because I would publish a video then for one month, not publish nothing mm -hmm. and just watch videos and see, oh, this guy started at the same point as me and now he has 100K <laughs> subscribers. But yeah, yeah, I mean the comparison there, what work did he put against what work am I putting? So, mm -hmm. but yeah, my goal is to just build an audience at the moment. I'm not monetized either. I'm not getting any money from it. So I'm purely doing it out of passion.
passion for mm -hmm. it at the moment. Got it. Yeah, I feel like that behavior of like posting and then like not posting for a few months. I was also like that for like three to four years. And I think honestly what it is, is it's just so hard when you have to work 40 hours a week. I yeah. mean, I'm a lot more consistent now since I quit. I probably post every week for the past three or four months. But that's only yeah. because I quit my job. Like, yeah, you have all the time. You have suddenly 40 more hours exactly. at least. It's kind of ridiculous if I don't post at least once or twice a week, right? At this point. Now, actually, I noticed that I'm encountering bottlenecks with my team. So it's not even just me at this point. Like, I have the freedom. I have the time to record the video, but I'll have team issues where, like, my uh, graphic designer is, like, out for a week, so I can't get a thumbnail, or my, like, video editor is too slow or something like that. So those are, like, yeah. other problems, but I definitely think, like, when you're working 40 hours a week, and you're also working 10 hours a week as, on top of that, so you're going 50 hours a week, it's just so hard to find the time to... It takes at least probably, like, 7 to 10 hours to make a video. And, oh, you just hired an editor, too, so you were doing all the editing before yourself. I was doing all the editing wow. myself, yeah. And recording, and also planning a wedding, because we arranged the wedding ourselves. <laughs> So it was busy. It was really busy. Mm -hmm. Also, on top of that, you still want to have some friends every now and then, uh, go on dates with my girlfriend back then and now wife. Mm -hmm. Still had to walk the dog, still had to go to the <laughs> gym, still had to clean the house, yeah. cook for myself. Luckily, my wife helped and helped mm -hmm. a lot in that. And I also helped her when she went freelancing for herself. Mm -hmm. But still, yeah, it's tough, I have to say. For sure. It's tough because it's a dream that you see that you know it's attainable, but it's also so far out of reach. Mm -hmm. But yeah for sure grinding grinding doing and mm -hmm. eventually everything will yeah yeah will happen yeah i find it really interesting i think how long have you been on youtube so far like how long have you been doing this thing i published my first ever video two years ago okay got it i actually started posting like productivity consultancy related mm -hmm. i was watching also ali Abdel, and there was also this guy called karma medic oh yeah i know him yeah, yeah. Nice. And I was really digging his content, like super light and fun. And they were like also doing videos together with Ali. And I was like, oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. That's like interesting. And the guy is from Canada even. So I was like, oh, I relate with that guy. He mm -hmm. went to another country to study. Then I started publishing. And of course I got demotivated because of the views. Mm -hmm. And then my videos were sucking and I was comparing myself a lot to other people. And then I stopped a little bit and then I came back and then I started again, and then I started finding myself who I wanted to be online, which I'm still trying to find out, actually. I'm still trying to find out who I want to be on the platform and what I want to do mm -hmm. as content. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. I find it fun. Mm -hmm. I think that's how I would describe it. The journey has been far so far. Could be better. Could have been making money already. Could have been a full-time creator, but mm -hmm. Everything takes time, yeah. I think. Good things take time. Out of curiosity, do you watch Hamza at all? It's interesting that you mentioned Hamza because <laughs> a video popped up to me the other day of him. I think it was like an interview with Chris Williamson, mm -hmm. a podcast where he was being called off mm -hmm. by him. Yeah. And Hamza was actually agreeing because he was, Hamza was someone that would, how do I say that? He would be into something, hustling into, okay, now I'm into fitness. If you don't do fitness, you're the worst person ever. You need to go to the gym every day, all day. He would post that for a month and then, oh, I'm single. This is the best life. And then the next week, oh, I have a girlfriend. This is the best life. If you don't have a girlfriend, you're the worst. And then, oh yeah, we broke up. So he didn't really sustain to what he was saying. But on the hand side, he agreed with that. Mm -hmm. I do find his content interesting because he's just a dude with a camera. That's how I see it. And he's really relatable on the things that he he say yeah no i listened to that podcast episode actually when it came out and his uh, inconsistency is kind of wild like he'll post one video where he's like in a cabin in scotland and being like i'm entering my fatherhood era with like his girlfriend he's like we're getting like we're having kids like it's like i'm starting a village with like my family and then the next month he's like oh i'm back in like dubai or something and, like having the single life so he is pretty inconsistent in that way the latest thing he's on right now is like entrepreneurship making money online as many people do something that i've been resonating with him his idea is like you make your offer and then you make your youtube channel or you only post videos that are completely in line with your offer. Well, the first question he asked is, do you want to be a YouTuber or do you want to be like an entrepreneur? And yeah. this is like the biggest, I even wrote on my whiteboard, like this unlock that I had from that video, right? And the dilemma is like, okay, let me ask you one thing. Would you rather have 100,000 subscribers and make $5,000 a month profit or have 10,000 subscribers but make $15,000 a month profit? I think it depends. On which one am I happy? Just, just based on those two situations, like literally it's like whatever. Number wise, if it's just money wise, definitely more money. Okay, so you don't value the status of having 100,000 subscribers that much then? I do value it, but it's just a number at the end of the day. As, mm -hmm. as long as I'm able to get my bills paid, same stuff money and have fun while doing it. If I have fun, mm -hmm. that's the most important. 
then I don't care mm -hmm. how much. Got it. So that's and you? interesting. I mean, I have decided that I'm going for the second category, which is like more money but less fame. But there was a bit of ego there when I was de debating that. I was like, oh, like, I wanted to be able to tell people that I have 100,000 subscribers. Or I wanted to have the fame associated with YouTube. Like, part of yeah. my soul was like, I want that external metric of success on the platform. Even more than I wanted, like, the money. Or maybe I even wanted the money just to tell people I have serving the money. <laughs> more than, like, what the money was doing. I think it's like a lot of programming, right? Like... When I tell people I'm a YouTuber, their first question is how many subscribers, how many views per video. They never ask me. I mean, some people do ask me how much I make, but there was that ego part of me, which was tr which was like pulling me towards the high views, high subscribers and away from like the money. And the money is what actually creates the lifestyle you want. It's not the views. Like views are like a very poor metric for money. Like sure, whatever, yeah. like all things are equal. More views equals more money. But very often people who make decisions for views are kind of on the opposite of for money. And there's tons of YouTubers out there who... They don't prioritize views, but they prioritize like education, value, and making contact that's in align with their offer, who make way more money based on per view. So yeah. that's Hamza's like new perspective that I've been like aligning with, and it's a big change I'm making. So going forward, I'm basically never gonna make any video that's not in align with my offer. I'm mm. only gonna make videos about software engineering, computer science, getting jobs in tech. And in fact, I'm just going to keep repeating like the same topics over and over and over again. If I have like five to 10 ideas, I'm just going to remix them in different packages over and over and over again, post one, two times a week. And that's just what's going to have to happen. And hopefully that will like blow up the business a lot more. But I wanted to ask you like, have you considered going? Because I feel like if you go all in on business, if that yeah. is a priority, I know like you like YouTube, you want to like make videos you enjoy. But if the goal yeah. is to be able to quit your job, why not like speed run to the actual money? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a good one. How I see it is I want to enjoy the progress. You know, it's like you rather be a millionaire now, mm -hmm. but be miserable with what you're doing. Or would you rather earn, take your time, maybe do it in five years, but at least you're having fun. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have that one. I'd rather be able to look back and say that was fun. I want to be able to be proud. At the end, it's just money, mm -hmm. but the experiences that I lived and that I'm leaving, I want to be able to be proud. At the end, it's just money, but the experiences that I lived and that I'm leaving actually, because I'm able now to create and talk with great people, like I'm having a conversation with you and it's just thanks to YouTube and I don't even have 2000 subscribers. So for me, that's more valuable, I'll get way more energy from that than from the money mm -hmm. side of it. Of course, I would love to be getting 10K a month just from my own things, right? But yeah. Got it. That's how I see it. Interesting. You mentioned you will have 10 videos mm -hmm. and then repeat them. Yeah. Would you have fun doing that, actually? Uh, yeah, I've also thought about this a lot. Like, so, okay, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, right? The other day I was, so I run this coaching program and I was in a coaching call with four students. And they were yeah. all, all asking me for help. And I was helping them like get results, help them move forward in whatever goals they have in terms of like career and software engineering. And I was having yeah. fun doing that. I was also having fun. I joined another coaching program. I don't know, do you know who Charlie Morgan is? No, but I think I do actually. I've heard him before. Yeah, he's like a YouTuber and he runs a program about scaling your oh, yeah. coaching program yeah. and consultancy and agency and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And I was really enjoying like watching those lectures, like considering my offer, working on sales and marketing. So what I've realized is like the idea of being a YouTuber, I'm not married to that anymore. Like mm. if I was a podcaster, that'd be sick. But honestly, if I was just a business owner and I had no public facing YouTube channel, I was just running paid ads or I was just going off of word of mouth, but I was running this business. As soon as I let go of like the fame thing, I think I accepted that I'm happy working on the business or doing other business things that are not just content creation. And it wasn't always like that. I think a long time ago, my brother called me and was like, hey man, why don't you just only make computer science videos? Those are the videos that are doing well. Why are you making all these random topics like how to avoid eye strain or how to have a good diet? Like or how to like hit the gym as a computer science student? Like, why do you care about these topics? Only make computer science. And back then I was like, no, like the artist in me cannot be like touched. I must only make topics that I'm interested in. But I think I've moved away from that. I think nowadays I only care about 95% of my brain is on like making this profit, running this business. Now, if I hated the work I was doing in the business, like let's say I hated coaching. Okay, then like maybe I can find some other yeah. way to do it. Maybe I can do like a self-paced course or do like some other kind of product like that. 
what I have realized is like, I enjoy those business things as much as I enjoy YouTube. So I'm not necessarily sacrificing my enjoyment. I think I'm just like deciding to let go of the desire for fame as much. That's a good way to phrase it. So basically it's a means to the end, let's say to the end of coaching. Cause that's what you are into. Yeah. I think what it is is like, what, oh, go ahead. Why not promoting it on going to universities and then just hunting flyers or QR codes. Hey, this is me or mm -hmm. I don't know, doing something crazy like hacking into the computer yeah. screen. Hey, I hacked into this computer. I can get you a job. Mm -hmm. Why not doing something like that? And why YouTube videos? Then? Yeah. Like what, why is YouTube my choice vehicle to get lead generation yeah. for this company? There's a few reasons why I think if someone gave me like another option, which is like, Hey man, if you run paid ads, you're going to get way more results. You creating YouTube videos is like a waste of your time and effort. Just switch to this and you'll get more money and you'll, you'll grow faster. I might actually consider switching, but nowadays actually, I don't know. Are you familiar with Hermosi's Alex Hermosi's content yeah. lately? So yeah. people like that are going all in on YouTube and organic content. And I've seen this like to my coaching program, there's a lot of people who apply to that. I just haven't figured out how to convert them. <laughs> so lead generation is not the bottleneck right now. And my videos are actually doing quite well when it comes to promoting my coaching program and product. And yeah. another aspect of this is when people watch my videos, they see me as an expert. Mm. Like they'll go on a binge of like five to 10 of my videos, get tons of value. Be like, yeah. wow, this stuff is super interesting. I'm learning a ton. This guy must know what he's talking about. You do have a way of convincing <laughs> me of knowing what, you, even if you perhaps are selling me a cookie, <laughs> you, you will be able to sell me a cookie. You have that level of confidence. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if that's a compliment. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> take it as a compliment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a compliment. Yeah. Whereas like if I just walked up to someone on the street and was like, join my coaching program, like they don't know anything about me. The level of like uh, salesmanship ability I, I would have to give to a rando computer science student on the street to sell them my program, like they're not going to buy it. Whereas when someone watches my five, 10, listen to my podcast, then like I'm in their mind. It's like that parasocial relationship. You know what I mean? That I'm building. I do think I can give them value. Even if I could give a random person value too, but they're not yeah. going to be convinced or at least the burden would be huge on me to convince them to join. So that's why I'm doing YouTube. And why not LinkedIn, for example, because you are helping people get jobs. When I, you tell me jobs, mm -hmm. I related to LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So I have considered LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn might be the next frontier that I do once uh, I feel like basically I'm doing theory of constraints. No, could you explain yeah, yeah, it to for me? Sure. So theory of constraints is this thing I like learned about a, a few weeks ago, which is one of those examples of like these crazy level up ideas. Right. And it's this idea that you've probably heard of bottlenecks before, which is like yeah. you're working on some sort of process or system. And one piece of that puzzle is restricting every, all of the outputs. So I yeah. did like a full analysis on my business, right? Every business has leads, conversion, and fulfillment. Leads are people hearing about your product. Conversions are people buying your product. And then fulfillment is your product actually doing what it is or fulfilling on the promise that you made that they bought into. And if we think about those three parts of the business, let's say I had 2 million applications to my coaching program. Every single computer science student in the entire world applies. Would I make more money? No. <laughs> because <laughs> I actually don't know how to convert them yet. So I'll give you that example, right? Now on the other side, mm -hmm. let's say I scaled up, I hired a hundred coaches and now we can process, we can handle 10,000 students joining. Would I actually make more money? No, because I don't know how to deal with the applications. And we're at a point mm -hmm. where I have 200, 300, 400 applications of the program through my website. And I just don't know how to convert them into actual money or people in the program. So when lead generation becomes an issue, which it will become an issue at some point once I create my conversion system. And once I develop better fulfillment by maybe hiring other people or getting better at coaching and more efficient at coaching, then it's like, okay, when I need more leads, when I've exhausted all the leads I already have, then I'll tackle that problem. So it's like, yeah. my guess is that YouTube will be like a cash mine for a long time. And my guess is that YouTube will get me to that 10 K profit a month without having to pick mm. another platform. But yeah. if I do need to pick another platform, LinkedIn is definitely at the top of the list. And there's a few reasons why LinkedIn is above the other ones. Uh, first of all, I don't like Snapchat. It's just, I'm just against Snapchat. <laughs> I'm against TikTok, whatever, like screw those platforms. I just don't want to use them. I don't consume content there. I don't like it. Pure bias on my, my behalf. And I'm sure there are millionaires on both of those. But again, the constraint, the theory of constraint states that when you think about a business, the one of the best ways to scale your business is identify the bottleneck and just alleviate the bottleneck and then identify the new bottleneck and then alleviate the bottleneck. Put 100% of your focus only on the constraint 
the bottleneck and you will have massive success. And the story is from this book called The Goal, which I would 100% recommend everybody who's, if they're ever interested in entrepreneurship, listen or read that book. It's told in a story about this like factory manager whose factory is failing. And what he discovers is like, there are a bunch of machines in a line. One machine is the bottleneck. Yet there are employees who are like making all the other machines super efficient. Like my bottleneck right now is my funnel, the ability to convert leads into dollars, right? But like, yeah. let's say I'm like stressing out about like, I need to make more Instagram posts. I need to post more stories. I need to go on LinkedIn. I need to shout about my product more, but I'm not actually going to make more money from that. So that is like my level up and why I've decided to go all in on conversions and then address the lead problem later. Makes sense. I understand then what you're referring to and how you're approaching it. And I think it's smart to first solve your issues and then think of expanding mm -hmm. into more ways. So first, yeah, you're getting from YouTube already 400, 300 applications, but you don't know how to convert them. Yeah. Then I think, yeah, that's the issue because then if you go and do the same on LinkedIn, perhaps you get 1000, but then if those are not conversions, what's the point of doing yeah. it? You're just wasting your energy. It's like a thousand ego boosts of like people submitting applications, but it's literally like, what am I supposed to do with this right now? So yeah, yeah, LinkedIn is definitely a possibility at some point, but YouTube is the thing right now to like, I, I mean, YouTube, there's also another aspect, which is like, you might ask, why don't I just stop all YouTube and only fix the conversions problem and just like stop posting until I do that. I think that's another ego thing. Like I don't want to quit my momentum on YouTube. I, I do like views. I like yeah. providing my audience content of me, just continuing building that relationship with them. So that's why I'm still consistent. Yeah, it makes sense. You recently started a podcast, Liftoff. Indeed. You're bringing software engineers into the conversation. Yes. Why? How does that convert into, mm -hmm. into the coaching? Yeah, good question. So I originally thought of starting this podcast probably in Feb February, January of this year. And I discovered it because I was reading this book called Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson. He's this like internet marketer guy. He has a bunch of books like dot com secrets, traffic secrets, and he has this book called Expert Secrets. And in the first chapter, he just randomly said, you need a podcast so you can talk to interesting people. <laughs> And then I was sold. <laughs> he was like, listen, man, you need a podcast so you can talk to interesting people. That was it. And again, that sounds kind of random, right? But that literally got me 50% of the way there. Because it's like, I mean, you're experiencing this, I guess, through your podcast. But it's like, if you just have a podcast, you can just get on calls with people and talk to them and meet them and build relationships with them. And I think Ali Abdal also talks yeah. about that with his deep dive podcast. So that was half of it. That was literally half the journey was just reading that one line in that book. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> the other half of it was realizing that if I want to bring value to my audience, it's hard for me to always go out there, do something in the world of software engineering and then bring the lesson back. Right. That's what I've been doing up until this point. I would get an internship and then I would talk about how I got that internship or I would pass an interview and then I would talk about how I passed that interview. But when I'm leaving my job in software engineering, I'm actually not in the game anymore of software engineering. So I can't just go out there and like get, build more experiences and come back all the time. So the level up was like, I want a podcast. Why don't I interview people who are already successful software engineers, people who have no internet presence, people who like, they have tons of lessons because they're, they're at Google, they're like at Microsoft. They clearly know what they're talking yeah. about. They're very successful software engineers. Why don't I bring them on my platform? Because I can build a platform. What I can do is I can make a video. I'm getting better at interviewing people and I can bring them on my show and have them display their lessons to the world. And it's a win-win, right? I don't have to always come up with cool ideas then. I can just have someone else come bring their ideas and maybe summarize it in a video later. And my audience still loves it because the value I'm providing is having the platform and being able to like interview these people and get those interesting ideas without the burden being 100% on me. So yeah. the value proposition, the mission is exactly the same. I make videos about how to land your dream job in tech. I bring software engineers who talk about how they landed their dream job in tech so you can land your dream job in tech. Makes sense. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it makes sense. I think it's actually a smart move from you, mm -hmm. especially when you quit your job and you're not there anymore in the software engineer world. Then you bring people that are still in the field and listen to their stories, whether it's from how they got started to what they do on their day-to-day -day life to what do they like about their jobs and if they have any tips because everyone is going to have different lessons and different experiences because every life is different 
And I think your audience will learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. 100%. I've benefited greatly from listening to podcasts. I've listened to at least one to 2,000 podcasts over the last few years. Like, no doubt. Probably yeah. over 2,000 at this which, point. Uh, which one is your favorite? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a list of like probably five to 10, which have changed. I'll just honestly, I'm just going to go down the list. I'm sure you're familiar with most of these as well. Oh, uh, we can just start with Deep Dive with Ali Abdal, just because like I love his content so much. I think they have like that like parasocial relationship with him. So whatever he puts out, I listen to. That's one. Colin and Samir, other YouTubers really like their content. Chris Williamson, incredible interviewer, incredible guy. Yeah. I look up to him a lot. I love his podcast. Uh, Huberman Lab, incredibly famous. I was actually early on the Huberman Lab. I listened to one of his first episodes when he ever started in 2020. And from 2020 to 2022, I listened to every single episode of Huberman Lab and probably some of them two or three times as well. Oh, wow. It's really good podcast on science, health, wellness, fitness. It's a lecture, actually, those podcasts, because it's him at the beginning, at least it was him sitting for two hours and a half, three hours, just explaining the science of things that apply to your life. Exactly. Dude, the guy would just sit there in his like black button down shirt <laughs> with his microphone and just talk for two and a half hours. And that was it was just all during or during COVID. So I had the time just to sit there and listen to that. But it was yeah. incredible. I'd never heard anybody break down these health and wellness tips that can be applied to productivity and development at that point. So that was like a massive level up uh, his podcast, Tim Ferriss show. I mean, I think Tim Ferriss show, which is very foundational because it was one of the first podcasts of its kind. I think it's a little bit less relevant nowadays. Like the listenership yeah. is, it's not relatively massive compared to how it used to be, but it like holds yeah. a special place in my heart. Cause it was one of the first entrepreneurship podcasts I've ever listened to. Yeah. He was one of the first guys that spoke about making money online. 100%. Yeah, and I think it's... He was just one of the first podcasts in general. As, as well. well, yeah. So he really he really invented that game. I'll, I'll end with Lex Friedman. I mean, all these podcasts are very famous podcasts, but hopefully some recommendations there. I think Lex Friedman's incredible. I don't listen to all of his episodes, but he brings on some of the most interesting people in the world, and I love every, all the lessons they give, so... Yeah, we have similar tastes, actually. Mm -hmm. I think Lex Friedman, I don't listen too much. I listen to either Joe Rogan... Mm -hmm. I find when he brings someone interesting, I like listening to it, not to every episode, because otherwise it's just too much, I feel like. And I also like listening to Andrew Schulz. Yeah. Flagrant. It's a little bit more funny. Yeah, <laughs> figuring It's more fun to listen to because he also brings jokes and stuff. But sometimes they, you can get some interesting knowledge there that you're like, oh, wow, I never really thought of that For sure. this way. Yeah. Joe Rogan is very f foundational to me, too especially early on, like 2020, 2021, 2022. And I will still go back and listen to some of his episodes if like the guest is really interesting. And Andrew Schultz too, like I'm flagrant. I actually saw Akash Singh a few months ago and he was really good. So huge fan of both mm. those shows as well. Nice. I have a question for you. What is your creative process like and how do you actually stay inspired? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Also, after I answer, I'm curious about you as well on this question. So. It's changed a lot. I think early on it was, I think this is a very early YouTuber thing. It's like, you think about, hmm, what am I interested in? Huh, this is cool. Maybe I should make a video about this. And then you go make that video. And then the next video you're like, hmm, what's something that's interesting? I'll go make a video about that. And they're very often just random topics here and there. Like if you look at my early videos, right? I have like a lot of productivity videos about apps and stuff like that. But then I have a video about like fasting, like how to fast effectively, like not eating and how to stay productive while fasting. Or I'll have a video about eye strain. Like I, I would encounter eye strain while using the computer for too long. Like what are my tips to not encounter eye strain? I would make a video about like lifting weights. Like what's my advice when it comes to lifting, how lifting changed my life, stuff like that. I have some vlogs in there, watch some Casey Neistat, make some vlogs. And that was my early creative process. I would just like wake up one day, be like, I'm gonna make a video about this topic, take a month, post the video, move on to the next video. Now it's completely different. So kind of in that point, like between those points of like pure interest versus like pure strategy, I started to realize that I need to create like a database of all of my ideas so that I have a list of every single idea I've ever thought of that I can draw upon. And I have that now. So I have a notion table called video machine. This notion table, has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of video ideas that I've discovered over the last three or four years. And I could make any one of those videos. So this is being constantly built up. I'm probably adding to it at least one or two videos every single week to that table. 
And you're probably thinking like, okay, how do I actually come up with these ideas? So there's a few different ways. One is the same thing as before. So like, I'll just have some realization about some topic, but I almost will never make a video nowadays that I just want to make. Kind of like echoing what I talked about earlier in this interview. I have a limited number of videos I can make. I'm paying an editor full-time to edit these videos. I have a goal, which is to hit this profit by a certain date. So I don't want to waste a video on some random topic that might be fun to talk about, but it's just not going to get very many views. It's going to dilute my audience. The sponsorship rate's going to go down because the views are going to be less. And overall, it's just going to be like a negative ROI for the business, even though it might be like a little bit of fun. So nowadays I mainly pick videos that through market research. So I'll look at like whatever's doing well on the platform. The biggest thing is looking at overperforming videos on other people's channels. So YouTube recommends me tons of videos. Half of my brain is consumer brain, but the other half is producer brain. So I'm studying these videos, thinking about like, okay, why is this title doing well? Why is this thumbnail doing well? Is there some need in the market that this is satisfying? And I'll give you an example, right? There's a trend going around that you probably have seen, which is how to get ahead of 99% of people. And there are dozens and dozens of videos with variations of that title in the last 12 to 24 months that have overperformed on people's channels. So I knew that that topic would go viral. And I actually got recommended another one from a brand new channel, million of views video from like three weeks ago from some brand new channel about hmm. how to get ahead of 99% of people starting today or something like that. So I took that variation of that title, changed it to how to get ahead of 99% of computer science students worked on my own version of the thumbnail, took inspiration from five to 10 other versions, brought it to Tintin, Tintin gave some really good feedback, gave it back to my graphic designer. And that video has almost 90,000 views in two weeks. Hmm. So I've done that over and over and over again. And that has been the best way to get viral hits. So that's like how I pick good titles. Now in terms yep. of the creative process, like once I pick a title I'm working on, I start with the title, then I start with the thumbnail. That's like a massive level up. You're gonna hear that from every YouTuber, right? Title and thumbnail first, but it's true. like. If you're someone who wants to start on YouTube, like do title thumbnail first. And then after that, I will just make like a rough script. So like, I'll think about, okay, what three to five principles can I do based on my own experience, based on my own life to fulfill this title. Sometimes I'll go out there and do research. So like for another video about that I made, I bought a book called the meritocracy myth, read a bunch of sections of that book, watched some interviews with like Obama, cause I wanted to put some of that stuff content in my video. And then I'll write out a script and then I'll sit down and record the video. In the past, I used to word perfect script every single video. So for my first 50 videos, it was two to 3,000 words, sometimes 4,000. It was the entire video was a word perfect scripted. But oh, wow. I realized that I need to improve my creative process, did the theory of constraints thing, realized that I need to pump out more videos. And the reason I wasn't pumping out more videos was because my videos were overly scripted. Yeah. And not saying that overly scripting is bad, but it would just slow me down. So nowadays, mm -hmm. I just make like a rough outline of everything I want to talk about, throw it together, sit down in front of the camera, record the video. I have enough practice with videos as well that I can be like confident even when I don't have like an exact script on camera. And then I send it to the editor. So it's kind of like a normal editor process. Editor takes a look at the video. Maybe they're working on the past video, but I just like instruct, okay, hey, like this new video is here. We have this deadline for the sponsor, stuff like that. Meanwhile, I'm also working with my graphic designer in the thumbnail. So I don't think my actual creation process is that unique, but Nowadays, I do mainly prioritize viral replication topics. Viral replication topics. I was going to ask you, do you mainly focus on viral replication topics? So you see this, how to get ahead of 99% of people, and then you're, okay, how does this apply to computer science? I'm going to do that. Exactly. And sometimes I'll straight up just copy the title too. I'm not copying the video, like it's a different video, but so yeah. another video that went viral was some guy made a video called like the unfair way I got good at lead code and lead code yeah. is the software that all the computer science students use to practice for coding interviews. And that video okay. got like a couple hundred thousand views unknown channel. And I just knew like, that's a title. <laughs> so I just swiped the title, made my own thumbnail based on like another viral video on the same topic, took elements of that title and thumbnail, made up my own thing made my entire 20 minute video with all my own ideas, principles, things from my own experience. And that video is at 50,000 views right now. So I have found lately that when I throw like my full guns at making the best thumbnail I can, best video I can, yeah. there's about a one in three chance of the video going viral. Right now I'm defining viral as hitting 30 to 40,000 views on my channel. Cause most videos yeah. are hitting like 10K views. So if I can get 30 to 40,000 views, I see that as viral. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
How long does it take you to make one video? From the moment you see this idea, perhaps there's a few weeks, but from the moment you grab the idea and I said, okay, I'm gonna make this how to get ahead of 99% of people. How long does it take you to script it, to design the thumbnail and then record? Mm -hmm. Perhaps you make a 10 minute video, but it, you record for half an hour. Mm -hmm. How long does it take the whole process? For sure. Yeah, so there's a level of latency between idea generation and actually executing on that idea. So I had decided that I was gonna make the video how to get ahead of 99% of computer science students four months ago. But that thing was in my video database and I was like just going through topics I had already decided I was gonna make. Like a couple weeks ago, I needed, I was like, okay, I'm gonna make this video. I need the next video. Let me put that, I think now is the time to make this video. So there are videos that I decided that I was gonna make years ago that I haven't discovered or haven't actually executed on that I will execute mm -hmm. on. But there are some other videos that are more urgent for some reason that I want to do first. So yeah. there's really no way to predict how much time it's gonna take after idea generation to the video to come out. But once I decide, okay, I'm actively working on this video, it probably takes me two to three weeks till the video is posted. But in that time, two to three hours to script and ideate, 30 to minutes to an hour of actual filming, but like maybe a few hour block to actually film the video. And then it probably takes me a few hours of uploading an instruction, like giving revisions to the editor, reviewing, there's probably five to seven cuts of every single video that I take a look at. And then reviewing that, giving feedback, working on the thumbnail, stuff like that. So in some total, I probably spend seven to 10 hours of my own time on every single video. That's not much. <laughs> you don't think so? No. Really? But I mean, I guess yeah. a lot of the hard work, like the editing, which is the, the editor spending at least 20 hours on a video. Yeah, okay, fair course. enough. The edit, So the editor helps you there in a sense. And same thing with the thumbnail. But from your... Yeah, from your time, it's only 10 hours then. Yep. Yeah, probably seven to 10 hours per video. What about you? Do you spend a lot more time than that? I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I still need to find a way to optimize my, my workflow. I try to see what I videos ideas I want to make. I think that's my first mistake. <laughs> I make videos that I want to make instead of videos that are, mm -hmm. yeah, doing good. I do try to give it a doing good style or I try to make two that I know could potentially get some views and one that I have fully enjoy, but that one that I fully enjoy making always tanks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, from the moment I have that idea, then it takes me perhaps two hours to fully script the video. I fully script them, like from start to finish, I get a rough outline and then it takes me two hours to do the first draft of the script. Mm -hmm. Probably like two more hours to do the second draft and then like a last hour I read it before I'm gonna start recording. I was like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Or yeah, no, maybe this. And then I record for like an hour. I think in total it takes me like between six and 10 hours. I also like doing a lot of the V-roll myself. I don't like like the stock footage because mm -hmm. I feel that it establishes more of a connection with my audience if I'm the one doing the V-roll. And that's the part that takes me a shit lot of time. Mm -hmm. So I had two cameras. I had a Sony A6400 and it fell and it broke and I couldn't record it and I had my settings. So if you look at my last four videos, they're all like I'm extremely white and there's like green on the background and that's because I couldn't change the settings of the color grading or anything. And now I bought a Sony A7 C2 and that one works like wonders, but to up speed my workflow. I don't do color grading anymore because color grading would have taken me like one or two hours extra from the editing. Mm -hmm. So I think overall it takes me like 10 to 15 hours to get one video out. Well, is um, that that's scripting, filming and editing 10 to 15 hours? Yeah, the editing now I outsource okay. it and I hire a guy that shout out to Mike. He's great. <laughs> that saves me 10 hours a week. I outsource my editings for 10 hours because that's what I currently can afford it's mm -hmm. my own pocket. Hopefully in the future, it's gonna be more. It's like channel grows, it's gonna be more. Mm -hmm. But for now it's that. And I f find it more of an investment in myself and my time that those are 10 hours I can spend with my wife or doing sports mm -hmm. or doing whatever I want. And then I solely focus on creating the videos and recording them and creating the B-roll. And now also this podcast. For sure. Yeah, I think outsourcing editing is like one of the greatest level ups you'll ever discover as a YouTuber. And I think every YouTuber wishes they did it sooner. I outsourced actually relatively quick. I think I outsourced one to two years in. 
but I hired my younger brother. So I don't know if you count that as outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a high schooler that was just editing my videos and he loved it. Cause like when you're a high schooler, you get paid like 200 bucks. You're like, Oh my God, like $200 is a lot as a high schooler to get my yeah. video. And I was a software engineering intern, so I could earn that money as an intern, film my video, but then outsource the editing to my brother. And that was kind of like my early flow. I worked with like a few different freelance editors until I found my full-time editor now, who I'm really happy with. But when I talk to people who are not in the YouTube game, they're always like, why don't you just edit it yourself? Like you're full-time, man, just edit it yourself. And it's just like, dude, why would I edit it myself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's also fun. I do like the editing, mm -hmm. but it just takes so much time. I mean, depending on the type of content, you do more of the talking heads, but if you do cinematic vlogs or whatever, yeah, yeah it does make sense that you do it yourself. Mm -hmm. If you go more for the filmmaking route and part of you, yeah, of the mm -hmm. content generation. For but sure. if you're just doing talking heads, man, it's just easier. Dude, it's a machine. It makes your life way easier. You were talking yeah. about the B-roll and I agree. Like, I think when you're in the B-roll, it looks way better, but it's just so irritating to always have to get new B-roll every time. Have you, have you done the thing where you have a B-roll library and your editor will just pick old footage of you and put it in there? Or are you getting new footage every time? No, I had it. And then the videos just became too old or too mm -hmm. bad, or they needed color grading. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to make a library again without needing to make color grading. Mm -hmm. I find that simplest switch, but the easiest no brainer, just disabling the color grading, recording in the nature profile, and then uploading it. Mm -hmm. The quality is going to be better than if I color grade because I'm not a color grader. There's mm -hmm. people that do that full time and it's just much fun and more easier to enjoy other parts of the process. Mm -hmm. 100%. I think, yeah, I don't even think I do anything with color grading. Like to me, color grading is just adjusting saturation and exposure and moving on. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> I've never even done any. I mean, I've like, I bought a few LUTs a long time ago and just, oh, this one's cool. And that, that was pretty much all my extent of color grading is. Out of curiosity, what niche are you in? Are you like in, kind of in the filmmaking niche? No, I'm doing more like- What's your channel? Personal man? finance, self-development. I don't even <laughs> know what that your you channel say is. That. <laughs> it's Matias Rico, <laughs> it's my name. Oh, it's personal I have finance. a few videos. Yeah. Dude. And self-development. You could hit, like, you could make this a business way faster than 2027. Teach me, tell all me right. how. What do I need to do? Yeah, okay. I think the biggest unlock is going to be uh, deciding what your offer is and then aligning your content around the offer. Just for a background, I have a bachelor in economics and a master in finance. Okay. So I think that gives me a little bit of a yeah, position. 100%. It's like you, are, you have computer science yeah. degree. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you one question. Okay, who do you think you can serve? What kind of person? Oof, that's a good question. I think I can serve a lot of people, but the people I'm trying to serve and that I want to serve is those, the one, they're per se not happy with their jobs and they want to be either financially independent or rich and they want it now, but they need to understand that the process is a slow process and it's better to make good progress, but slow than fast progress that will diminish it in the long run. Mm -hmm. So healthy progress. Got it. I don't know if that answers the question. No, that gives me something to go off of. So who is this person though? If we like describe this person, like your avatar, who would this person kind of be like, what's their background and experience and stuff like that? I think that person would be me first year of my bachelor. Got it. So yeah. economic student, finance student, studying those subjects and they, they, their desires to get rich fast, but they need to understand that you can, you need to get rich slow. Yeah. Like you're not rich. You don't have money. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to, you're just going to burn out if you go all in and you still need to pay your own bills mm -hmm. and try to get rich. So what you see online of like Iman Gatsi, the dude started when he was 14 years mm -hmm. old, he was living with his parents or his mother in London. So he, you get lucky, you know, like there's these cases. But these cases show what is possible and what people think is the norm. Mm -hmm. But there's just like a handful of people. Yeah. I also think he grinded for like God knows how long. He spent hours and it, it was not fast for Iman. He started early. That's no, why he's young. Exactly. He's a young millionaire because he started when he was 13 or 14. If you're yeah. like 27 and you're, you're like, oh, Iman Gaji is like 24. How is he so rich? Dude, you start now, it'll take you to like 35 or 36 if you want to be like him. Yeah. So I think that's definitely like a misconception. But let me ask you, what are those principles you'd like to teach your younger self? 
Like, why don't we go through some of those high-level principles? That's a good question. I have them written down. If let me pull them, my notion. Yeah, no worries. Because I think that helps me. I don't have principles per se, but I know that there's not people focusing on the core basics, mm -hmm. on how to. People just want to be rich, but there's no actually education on yeah you, how to manage your own money that you can invest that. The process is more than just opening a TikTok account and selling ads on TikTok and selling drop shipping. There's more to that than mm -hmm. just doing that. Got it. And whether you want to be rich or not, I just want you to be happy with your own decision. Mm -hmm. If that's working at Starbucks and earning minimum wage, at least be happy with that. So what is an outcome you think you can do for your younger self in this area? Like, could you get your younger self to save, like earn $500 a month in savings on top of what they're saving right now through like your strategies and tactics. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a, so in Europe, we earn way less than you guys earn in America. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I think from someone from the US, that will be something for sure. Mm -hmm. So if you, have a US, if you have a US person you're helping, you could help them save what, like maybe even closer to a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Okay. I think so. If we make it. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So how do you feel about helping people earn through saving through your five step framework? So they get on a call with you or you, you start with one-on-one -on -one coaching them and you effectively break them. You go, you walk through all your principles you ensure they actually do it. And within three to six months, the transformation is that they're saving over, they're saving a thousand dollars a month without losing any happiness. Yeah. What do you think about that? That's something that could be doable. Yeah. And they're saving a thousand dollars a month. So they're getting 10 K of value over a year, at least, if not more. So what if you yeah. capture that upside? Like, let's say you charge them a thousand dollars and you take them through a, like a four week program where you teach them and over six months, they're going to start saving a thousand dollars a month and you just offer a guarantee. It's like, Hey man, if it doesn't actually work for you, if you do everything I say and you don't end up saving a thousand dollars a month by month six, I'll give you a full refund. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. You, I think. I can put a lot of excuses, but I think the main one I have now it's time. Because mm -hmm. as I said at the beginning, I have to pay my bills sure. and things like that. And that's the only restraint I'm currently having, which is time. Mm -hmm. I know that as soon as I'm able to save certain amount of money, I'm able to just say, fuck it, let's try mm -hmm. it and do it. I even did coaching courses myself, like career, life coaching, career coaching type of coaching. So I will be able to coach people mm -hmm. and call myself a coach yeah. in that sense. And I think $1,000 is not something difficult mm -hmm. to attain. Yeah. Especially if you have the guarantee, like you say like, Hey client, if you literally don't get all of this back times five, I will give you the thousand dollars back. Like there's literally like a hundred percent satisfaction guarantee here. Like there is no risk on your behalf. Uh, but yeah. what I would challenge you is. People think that, I think there's a fundamental misconception that I am breaking this down now. Like I just realized this a few weeks ago that you build up your channel and then one day your channel will be big enough so that you can make an offer and then you can be financially free. And what I'm realizing is that the fastest way to be financially free and not be dependent on your nine to five is to work on your offer as hard as you're working on your content. So that 10 to 15 hours a week that you're spending on YouTube, at least, if you can take 40% of that and put it into your product and sales, you will probably accelerate your journey to hitting 10K a month profit one to two years faster. If you like have that yeah. mindset shift, it's like, I'm going to make this one of the best products in the world. And the reason why I said you start with one-on-one -on -one coaching is that's a much easier sell and it allows you to make a better product. Whereas if you made like a course, again, you could also sell a course for like $200 money saving course. If this doesn't work for you, I'll give you the $200 back. That, that's also a really good sell. And that note, that would be a lot less time. So that's another option here. If you want to make some sort of course, which is like a self-paced five to 10 hour course that you can market to your audience, obviously go through all the branding things, show it some of all these team to help out with that, but market it as like, dude, send me an email. If you follow these five principles in the course and you don't end up saving X amount by month six, I'll give you a full refund for the $200. Yep. You could do that. That would save you time. Now it's still going to be a harder sale than one-on-one -on -one coaching because people like the fact that it's kind of like done for you. The fact that like the yeah. coach is getting on the call once a week and you're talking about like the whole framework and everything like that. I think nowadays something that I'm leaning towards is doing coaching plus course all in one. 
So it would be, you pre record a course with these principles, but then coaching you help actually implement the ideas that they learned in the course. So I think that's like the one, two punch and you can start to charge two, three, four K for that. But I feel like if you just take a few clients and just meet them once a week for like an hour for a thousand dollars each for a month, I think yeah. that'll be like a massive level up. And now that you say that you only need 10 people to get to <laughs> 10 K a month. Dude, think about that. 10 people, 10 people, you meet them once a week. That's 10 hours a week for 10 K a month. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, the only problem I think of that it's, I really need to be targeting that person in the U S or Canada, let's say, because if I think someone here in the Netherlands, for example, 10 K, okay, here people are a little more savvy with money. Like we don't just do everything on credit cards. We only have debit cards. <laughs> people use debit cards, which should be the norm, I think. But if someone comes here, yeah, salary is like 2 K minimum wage is 1,700 euros. So telling them that they will be able to save 1 K that's a little bit of, of mm -hmm. I know that that's not going to happen because that's literally 50% of your income. Sure. Now, if yeah. you just target people in the U S and then you just do it for people in the U S and then you just accept people in the U S on your program, mm -hmm. that's a little bit easier, but yeah. it also, yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you probably watch this Alex Ramosi video where he talks about this, right? When you first start out, sell to the rich cause they pay more. And yeah. then once you're hitting 10 K a month profit, you quit your job, you're financially free, then work on maybe, Hey, maybe I can sell like a $50 mini course to people all around the world and how to save money. Or you can make like a Netherlands only product or something like that, where it's like only specifically people in this area can somehow you can serve those people. And they also have the free videos, man. Like you're still giving out this ideas for free. You're not like abandoning the people in your country, but no, indeed. yeah, I think if you want to hit that 10 K a month, you can do it, dude, honestly, you could do it in 12 to 24 months of actual effort, maybe even faster than that. You might even have a better niche than me, dude. Like if you can figure out how to sell to people in their twenties and thirties in the U S through like this product that we talk about, because I can only sell to computer science students and these students are yeah. younger than me and the students have to get money from their parents, which is like a massive barrier I'm encountering lately. I'm working yeah. through it. Like it, it is going relatively well, but dude, 10 K a month, a year, I give you, if you actually start now and you actually start taking action on this. And with that, you need to make your content aligned with that offer. So it's like, once you sit down and actually align the offer and read, I don't know if you've read Alex Ramosi's book, but he has a book on offers. You read that book, you apply everything he says towards this offer. And then you only make content that's like a similar topic. And in your content, you pitch your offer. Like you're literally like every single video for like a minute or not maybe not a minute, 30 seconds. You say something like, and if you're interested in actually working directly with me to implement this advice, to hit this outcome, you're going to save a thousand dollars a month by month six or your money back. We work on a pay, a pay on results basis. If you say that and you put the link at the top of your description to your Calendly to book a sales call, dude, you're going to get a bunch of people booking sales calls and you're going to make a bunch of sales. I'll think about it. I'll really think about yeah, it dude. and start implementing. <laughs> Aman, to end this podcast, what's one piece of advice that stuck with you that they gave you that you would like to share with the audience? What's one piece of advice that has stuck with me throughout my whole journey? Invest in yourself. I think, and maybe this might go against everything we just talked about related to saving money, but the greatest bet you can take is on yourself. I'm going to be able to return more than 5% a year. <laughs> I just know it, dude. Like if I put a thousand dollars in my own business or my own skills, I'm going to get more than $50 back from that. I just, I know what's going to happen. So some of the greatest unlocks I've ever had in the last year has been, or even three years ago, man, like buying a camera when I was a college student, that camera was like. 600, 700 bucks, buying a microphone for $400. That was expensive. And people are like, why would you ever spend your money on that? Like, why not save it, put it in savings, like a high interest savings account, or why don't you put it in the S&P 500? But I have returned so much more and I hope to return even more and more and more through investing in myself constantly. And investing in yourself means spending as much money as you want on books, getting podcasts, paying for YouTube premiums, so you're not watching ads all the time, buying coaching programs, buying courses, and really committing that you believe that you can make more if you put this money into yourself. So that is some of the greatest advice I've ever encountered and has changed my life. That's a great piece of advice. I thank you, Aman. Where can they find everyone? Where can people find you? Yeah, I mean, just Google my name, Aman Manazar on YouTube, and you'll see all my videos there. It's the best spot. We'll link it down below. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Really 
find it insightful and enjoy the the coaching session at the end. <laughs> that was also really insightful. For sure. Awesome. It was great to great to talk with you.